Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me and my very special guest. He is one of the entertainment industry's most beloved stars. You know him from such shows as Ragtime, Jelly's Last Jam, Kiss of a Spider Woman, King Headley 2, Man of La Mancha, Shuffle Along, and from his Tony Award-winning performance in Cole Porter's Kiss Me, Kate. And he has been the chairman of the Actors Fund for the past 16 years. And now this coming Sunday afternoon, February 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, he kicks off his brand new concert with Seth Radetzky as part of the Seth Concert Series that streams right here at Broadway World. Please say hello to my dear friend, Brian Stokes Mitchell. Hey, how are you, Richie? It's so good to see you. It's so good to be with you. I know we're playing with like internet and we're trying to get our lights yes. going and everything else. You look great. So you got Thank you. I, I'm trying to look better. My light keeps moving up on me. See, that's the problem with these things now. I don't know about you, but now yeah. I've been doing so many of these things. It's like now you're not just the performer, you're the lighting designer, you're the costume designer, you're the audio engineer, you're the you know camera person, you're the and if any one of those guys messes up, something, you know, it all goes bad. So now my lighting guy's messing up right now. See, my light is keep moving up like this. Well, I guess I'll, my, my eyes will be in mysterious shadow for this, at least. You look great. Every day that I do this, it's something new. It's either sticky internet that you have to fix really <laughs> quick, or someone else is in a barn somewhere, or someone's in Switzerland. or So you're on the Upper West Side, my friend, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So it, it, we, it should be simple, right? But it's not. Okay, so I'm in Hell's Kitchen. You're on the Upper West Side. I had Cherry Jones from Switzerland. She had the best internet connection. Maybe we need to move to Switzerland. Oh, totally. How, <laughs> how are you and the family doing? Tell me. Everybody is doing well. We are, we're, we're uh, you know, everybody is thriving. My son is in, in school and in hybrid school. Uh, so, you know, he's there part of the time and, and part not. His school has been doing an, an incredible um, uh, uh, job of, you know, keeping everybody safe there. They've been testing all the time. I've been doing a lot of television. So, like, uh, I, up until yesterday, I had, like, five COVID tests in, in five days. I've been working on lots of different uh, projects. And uh, every everything looks good still, you know. I I I am still full of antibodies, it seems. Uh, but my wife and son, um, I of course had it, you know, last March now, which seems so long ago. But they they never contracted it, you know. And it says a lot for just wearing a mask and washing your hands and and being careful as well. So everybody is safe and well. And you know, Allison is busy with Actors Equity, and and she's also one of the founding members of Black Theater. United. And, um, you know, she's, she's always on the phone. It's just, she walks out of the house on the phone on a call and she walks in the door on the house on a phone and then she gets on a zoom. So I don't know how she does it, but you know, it's everybody as well. So thank you. That was a very long answer to a very short question. No, I love that because I was going to ask you, you have used your voice and your notoriety during this pandemic. Let's talk about Black Theatre United. I mean, how did that all come about? That that started about you know it, uh, with the conversation with Lashans and Audra and uh, McDonald and Shelley right. Williams actually and they were just first on the phone and and you know they said well it started out because we were mad because of the murder of George Floyd that happened you know and um, and then we they started calling some other friends and we were all feeling what can we do we need to do something yeah. so now there's there's 19 of us founding mem members the nice thing about it is we're all you know old friends and between us I think we figured out there's about 500 years of experience on Broadway uh, that we all have and uh, so we decided to kind of tackle this together so it's been really really nice um, we meet at least once a week many times more times because we have committees as well do, dealing with lots of different things and and we just shot a video uh, uh, um, a couple days ago which will be uh, uh, I think announced formally in another a couple of days but it was actually it was really fun because it was the first time uh, since we started meeting in June that we had gotten together in three dimensions. We'd only been meeting in you know yeah. this two-dimensional space on on Zoom and on on the internet and StreamYard and all these different ways. And uh, so it was really really nice to actually see people, and we were all COVID tested, so you know we just hung out like a, it was like a family reunion. It was really special. 
You know, it's interesting because everything that you've done and every other actor, it's been so safe because like you said, you get those cottons, you, the swabbed up your nose. I mean, the COVID tests, I mean, it's all done so safe. There, I, I'm sure on these on these television sets, it's all, you know, just a limited group of people. They're all masked. Everyone's tested. I mean, it's safer now than it's ever been, right? Yeah, it, they've been doing a really incredible job. I got to say that the television uh, um, shows that I've been on and uh, some of the films as well. I mean, they're testing people constantly and yeah. um, they have all these different pods and ways that they've done it. And and of course, it adds a lot to their, their cost because yeah. now they also have... Uh, you know, like a COVID team that's there as well. And uh, sometimes you'll be talking to somebody and somebody will walk up and you say, oh, I'm a little farther apart, please. Uh, you're a little too close. Um, but it's all it's all for a good cause. And and it's it's uh, it's proving to be uh, the right way to do things, because, you know, so much of television has has come back. And um, so, you know, it, it gives me hope for for uh, for our, all of the industries as, as well. Have you had a quarantine like in a hotel? Have you been able to come home sometimes? No, thankfully, I, I haven't had to quarantine. I did a, a, um, a concert in Utah, actually. I've done a few uh, concerts and other television shows as this has been going on. Um, and I was out in Utah and I had to quarantine when I came back, but only for a limited amount of time because I got tested, you know, and they had the new rules. So I think I quarantined in the house for, for four or five days or whatever it was. And, and uh, because I got a second test and then that came back negative as well. Um, so but I haven't had to do it in a hotel room. And some of my friends have had to do that, especially if they go to to, uh, you know, Australia or Canada. I think that would drive me crazy. My first question to them always is, do you have a balance? balcony because uh, i just cannot imagine being locked in one room for for two weeks but you know we do what we we need to do to to get through this and and work through it so um I, i'm sure i would too if if i were asked to do the same thing yeah you know it is now our 350th day and we're coming up on our year anniversary since the new york theater shut down does that date all seem surreal to you like sometimes doesn't it feel like two months ago and then sometimes it feels like it's a year yeah, I've totally lost track of time. Every yeah. day is blur's day, you know, and there's no hours. I don't, I can't tell anything anymore. Um, I was doing, along with Allison, we were both doing a show. Uh, we were working on uh, City Center Encores. We were doing Love Life there, and we were four days from opening, and we had our one and only run through of the show. It was actually the only run through, uh, the only uh, that a, a professional theater has done. It's the only time that show has been seen in like seventy seven years. Was the run through that we we did. So um, you know, it was really sad because I was down on the stage and they literally just finished building the set. And I sat on part of the set because there was something I needed to try out. And then one of the crew members came in and said, "We just got just got word Broadway shut down." And um, and that seems you know I, I don't remember is is that was only two months ago? Was it three months ago? Was it eight months ago? Was it a year ago? Was it two years ago? It's just so hard to tell with time anymore. But you know I know a lot of people are just feeling it and hurting so so badly um, yeah. from it. You know I'm still uh, uh, the, with the Actors Fund chairman of the board there and um you know our emergency assistance fund and the actors fund has really stepped up the staff there joe ben and Cassia, everybody has really been spectacular with our emergency assistance fund and lots of other programs that we have going on there as well to kind of help uh, people uh, tide people over um but you know it it's like we're st the it's we, we've been saying it's like two two years uh, probably to kind of get through COVID, but for anybody in show business, it'll probably like five business five yeah. years to to recover um, from it all. So it's a very difficult, challenging time. But you know what's great about the Actors Fund? They were the first organization. Them, you, and Broadway Cares were the first that stepped up, came out, and said, "We're here to help anybody." You know, in in the business who's suffering, and that must make you just feel so grateful about all these incredible fundraisers that have taken place with all these incredible artists who have donated their time for the Actors Fund. How grateful are you? I am incredibly grateful. I'm so grateful to all of the people who, you know, uh, like uh, Seth Rudetsky, the Seth and James show, Stars in a House, they've been doing, I don't know, I think they're on their gajillion show now uh, doing this. Uh, they've raised, I think, uh, 
uh, more than half a million dollars at this point for the Actors Fund. This is something they've done, started as a volunteer um, thing. Uh, and then people will call in for that show, you know, and and, and they'll say, we've got, uh, um, uh, uh, somebody wants to give, you know, $5 or $10. And, you know, some people might think, you know, that doesn't sound like very much. But yeah. first thing, to remember that most people aren't working you know yeah. uh, and for people to give five or ten dollars that money is so appreciated and we are so grateful for that um and um and and just then for that to be his show now has gone worldwide you know he gets yeah. donations from japan and from all over the place uh, of people that are watching the show and it's really really incredible to see how people are coming together but also we have companies that are coming together TikTok, we did this yeah. uh, ratatouille musical recently uh and uh, partnering with them uh, netflix has uh, donated a lot the the unions everybody has been coming together to help the actors fund because they know that we're we're helping out too but i i have to say thank you to everybody who has been donating to the fund and helping us out because uh um we we couldn't do it it's a collaboration that is is uh not just um the the people and the staff there and the board it's it's all of us all of the people that are coming up with these incredible ideas and interesting videos jason Hallen and the cast yeah. of beautiful and and what they did and rosie o'donnell coming back as well and just every day there there people are coming up with ideas he, we want to do something new for the actors fund and it's just so appreciated and and anything at all that people give i i just want also people to know that we understand how hard it is for everybody and for people to be donating to the actors fund like they are is just really amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. That is great. Well, congratulations on this Sunday because this Sunday afternoon, February 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you'll be kicking off your brand new concert with Seth Radetzky as part of a Seth concert series uh, that uh, streams right here at Broadway World. How excited are you? I am so excited. It's great to be doing this. You know, it's crazy the the technology that he has. One of the things that that happens with uh, being on the internet, of course, is there's this time delay. Yeah. So um, you can't really do anything live. They figured out this system where we can actually play and sing live with each other without a delay. And it, I'm just so excited to do this. First thing, I love Seth. Seth yeah. is one of the most brilliant people in the theater, I think. His knowledge, his uh, pianistic skills. Did we first meet on Ragtime or was it before that? I can't remember when we first met, when he, he played uh, Ragtime uh, for, for part of the time as well. Yeah. Um, his knowledge, his appreciation, his humor, his wit, his yeah. uh, just... Uh, He's just a, a, a phenomena. I don't know how he does it. And he's got all of this energy and he's doing stars in the house with James uh, in, in addition to all of these other things. it's We're going to have so much fun. We had a little rehearsal yesterday uh, just to run through with it all. And I, just that rehearsal alone was just full of laughter and, yeah. and joy. And I, I, I can't wait for everybody else to, to see that and experience that as well. You know, we'll be doing just some favorite songs from the theater and telling stories new and old and uh and doing some new songs as well and on um, some things from my album my last album plays with music and just having a really good time and you know that's what we need now we, we can't yeah. have enough joy in our lives and for people especially that love the theater and, and just love to laugh and just uh just uh, just want to have a uh, want to feel good that's it, it, that's where to go watch watch i hope you're you're able to join us uh, on sunday at, at, oh i'm at, there i i've watched all of these you know kelly o'hara has been on a few times during the pandemic and she kicked off seth's series and she said early during then they hadn't we hadn't synced anything yet because no one knew anything about this whole new world and she said we'd lose the internet connection it looked <laughs> like a godzilla movie she was like we didn't care though because it came back you know we were singing from the heart you know it was her and seth and but now like you said you know he sent you that box or whatever with the with the microphones and download all this stuff and it's like you're totally in sync and I would think one of the great things about this is that your fan base, which is anywhere in the world, can watch you all at the same time just by purchasing a ticket. And that must make you feel so great where no one, you know, a lot of people can't go out anywhere, but they can sit in the safety of their own space and watch your incredible concert on Sunday. 
Yeah, it's you know, it's been it's been uh, I've been amazed at the creativity of yeah. all of the different people, the different artists, the different technicians that are uh, still allowing artists to do what they do. Um, yeah. One of the other boards I'm on, I'm on the board and the art uh, and uh, uh, the artist committee of Americans for the Arts is the other thing that I spend my time with. And um, you know, the the arts bring in so much money um, for uh, to, to the United States. It's I think four percent of the GDP. Um, um, you know, it's it, we bring in more than transportation sectors do and a lot of the other sectors as well. And people don't really appreciate, I think, uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, most of your 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 viewers and um, people that watch your show and, and my fans as well are appreciators of it. But I, there are so many people that don't really appreciate the importance of art yeah. and what artists really do. Uh, I, it, it's been artists that have gotten us through this yeah. whole pandemic. I mean, what have we we done? We sit and we binge watch television. Yeah. You're watching the work of artists when you watch that. Not only the actors, but there are writers, there are technicians, there are camera people, there are producers. There are composers and arrangers and there are uh, uh, orchestrators and there are all of these people backstage, hundreds and sometimes thousands of people that are working on a project. When you play your video game, people aren't playing code, you're playing the work of artists. The people that drew the characters and the skins that everybody gets to put on and the way that they move through these different worlds that have been created as well. That's what artists do. And people a lot of times think of this as it's entertainment. That's not really yeah. art. No, that's art. That's what artists do. That's what people who study art go into. And that's the 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 value and the joy that we get out of it. Art is everything in our lives that is beautiful, that is not nature. It's it's yeah. produced by art. I just look around your own room right now, wherever or whoever you may be, and you'll see all kinds of art, whether it's the person who wove your carpet or the art that you put on your walls, the yeah. books that are sitting on your bookshelf that were written by artists as well, you know, the songs you listen to on your, on your uh, earphones, you know, to, to try to get you through the day. Artists have gotten us through this pandemic, and we really need to focus on uh, on uh, helping artists and getting that sector going uh, as well, because that's, uh, you know, someone said art, artists are the conscience of a society. And also one of the interesting things is look at all of these ancient societies. What exists from those? Do we remember the people? Do we remember the governments? Do we remember, um, you know, uh, what do we remember from them? Their art is what we see from ancient Greece and Mesopotamia and um, in Iran, Iraq, in Africa, in, you know, the uh, the, the caves of Lascaux and um, all of these these places. It's the art that, that lasts, you know, and, and, and connects us to our past as well. No, and I think now it's finally happening. I think people are finally realizing that the arts have gotten us through this pandemic and we need to open this all up again. It all has to open up. And I think it's slowly happening. I just hope it happens a little faster. And, uh, you know, what I want to ask you is what part of your home have you turned into your stage or your studio? <laughs> well, like, where are you doing Sunday's concert from? We're here, but you know, I, I won't show you the rest of it because my wife just walked in and said, oh, your room is such a mess. And so I have to have a very particular angle. And as you see, one of the things that I'm doing before the concert is I need to finish painting this wall. I put I I I started this like before the pandemic. I started doing samples, but then everything closed down and I couldn't even paint. So now this is one of my projects before we do this is to is to finish painting this room. But this is actually my studio where I do my recordings. I did um, my last album. I do all my vocals here. I do all the editing here because I produced all three of my albums. And, yeah. uh, and the first album as well. The second album, I actually, I did live in a studio with Ted Firth, my my pianist and friend that I work with all the time. But this is actually it, and I, I won't I, I won't even show you what it looks like right now because there's just stuff everywhere. Um, also, because in preparation for the concert, I've had to move things around and try to move lights, and so it's a mess. But it will look beautiful on Sunday. I can tell you that. So you're also a set decorator or set designer yeah. right and that's the other thing and that's set. i gotta fire that guy that you know hasn't painted the set for all this time now you know it's just uh oh, man with just, just finding good workers these days is so hard 
The only person you can blame is yourself, Stokes. That's the only person you can blame. You know, everybody I've spoken to said, Richard, this is my little area. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Because it borders. Beth Level had just moved and she was like, there's boxes to the left. There's boxes yeah. to the right. So you find your own little window on these things saying, oh, I look good in this little window, right? <laughs> Yeah. And I used to, I'll do it a lot of times from another room, but my son is on school in one room and my wife is on meetings in another room now. And, you know, so I was stuck here with this and I, and I was trying to think, okay, maybe I'll just do this and move the camera there so nobody can see it. <laughs> now, you know, but at this point, you know, let's, let's just live truthfully. Oh, I love this. So you're going to do some songs. I mean, I have a lot of your art behind me. I've got Kiss Me Kate. I got Rags. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like, are you going to do some of your favorites from those musicals? Yes, you know, what? here's what I love about Seth yeah. is you just never know what you're going to do. You know, I, I gave him a list. I mean, I had no so many songs. I gave him a list. It must have been of 30 songs. Now, we can't do that many songs. Yeah. I said, what do you want to do, Seth? You know, pick the ones you like, you know. And so he picked some from that. And then I added some more. And then we took some out. And, and, I, I, and I said, well, how are we going to do this? He said, I don't know. We'll just, you know, shout out songs. So I have no idea exactly what we're going to sing. But it's one of the things that I love about Seth because he's yeah. such an incredible pianist and artist. And uh, he can just do that. And, uh, and and then, you know, it leads from these wacky conversations we have with about all kinds of things. So I don't know what it is. That's the other thing that I'm really looking forward to this. It's just going to be so much fun. Well, you're also offering a very special VIP sound check ticket at 12 noon on Sunday. Now, I love these and I know the fans around the world do because, you know, normally people would go to a concert. You walk in, the room is all set, the lights are all beautiful, and then you see a show. But now you're going to take them behind the scenes of how it's all put together. How cool is that? It's really fun, and I think it's a really smart thing that Seth has done because uh, yeah. you get to kind of like see under the hood like you do. And because, uh, you know, the, the people that that uh, that watch these shows, they're such fans of what we do. And uh, and many of them probably have done it at some time or another, whether in their high school or a community theater as well, if they haven't done it uh, professionally. Uh, so they kind of know a little bit of that. But I, for me, I think that's the fascinating part. How do these things get put together? Because when you see them, they look... Look, oh, that's simple. And they just got together and they're just singing songs. And there's lots of planning that goes into yeah. these things. Uh, not only the technology, but Seth and I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just praying that I'm going to remember lyrics to these things because that's the that's the hardest part. I never forget the music, but the lyrics sometimes go out. Uh, so um, it, it'll be it'll be nice to do that. And also my my charts. Uh, that that uh, Ted Firth did a, a lot of the charts. We could do a lot of core arranging together, but he does these incredible piano charts. Oh, yeah. but they're they're not easy charts. And Seth was cussing up a storm at me when I said, "Oh, let's do uh, feeling good," or "Let's do uh, getting married today," or you know some of the songs that we were thinking of doing because they're really difficult songs to play on the piano. But and you need a virtuoso pianist yeah. like a Ted Firth or Seth Rudetsky to pull it off. Well, you've got it. We got to give a big shout out to Ted Firth, one of my all time favorite people, one of the greatest musical directors and arrangers there is on the planet. Right. So we have to give Ted a big shout out. Yeah, I just I just love him. So he's yeah. just incredible. We have kind of a brain meld when we yeah. when we work on music. We've been working together for a number of years. It's funny because uh, we started I was on my solo concert that I did at Carnegie Hall that I did also for the Actors Fund and my regular pianist wasn't available. And Richard J. Alexander said, well, I have this other guy, this new guy, Ted Firth. Uh, and I said, I don't want to work with a new pianist and everything. He said, well, just meet with him. We'll have this little rehearsal. And uh, so I said, OK, I'll meet with this guy. And and we sat down and just uh, I gave him one of my charts. And uh, I don't know, five seconds in, I said, oh, this guy is <laughs> this guy is it. And he and I have been together ever since. And just a brilliant, brilliant musician and one of the nicest people you'll ever met as well. Yeah. Have you chosen your outfit, what you're going to wear on Sunday? I have not. That's going to be a last, uh, the last thing. You know, all I need to choose is my shirt, right? I mean, you know, who wears pants anymore anyway? So, um, no, I, I have, I haven't chosen it yet. I think I'm going to wear something bright and fun. I, you know, I'm good. No, I can't even show you that because I have stuff hold, held. Up. I was going to say, you know, that you see these wood doors behind me, so that's going to be kind of my background. Um, so I'm going to wear something that maybe pops me out from the, you know, I want it to be bright and fun. And, and, you know, I've been wearing a lot of black lately, like everybody does in New York, you know, just because it's easy and you know, you know, it's winter and, and all of that. But I thought I want to wear something kind of colorful and, and I don't know what it's going to be yet. And, right. and, and I'll, and, and, and pants optional. That's the, that's the best. Got part. It. 
Because I've changed it all up. I started to wear ties. I'm like, I always wear bright colors, but I was like, I'm going to keep doing this on TV. I'm going to wear shirts, bright shirts and Easter colors and spring colors. And like, you know, totally. So you turn it out. You're also a costume designer for Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to your resume too. You know, yeah. I never asked you, um, how has being a dad changed the way you've looked at your life and your career? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it's like e everything about it, ac yeah. actually. You know, I'm one of these people that <clears throat> all through my, you know, younger years, um, I, I've always loved kids. Kids have always loved me, but I'm not one of these people that ever had the desire to have kids. I know a lot of people that know, you know, when they're teenagers, like my son, he wants to have a family. He wants to have kids. He knows already that, you know, I've never, I've never felt that way. And when we got to the point where I thought, yeah, I, I'm, it's time to do that. Um, you know, we made the decision and, and man, it, it has been so amazing. We also have an amazing uh, son. He's, you know, an old soul and it, it just uh, has a great sense of humor. He's kind, he's, He's he's smart. He's just really really fun to be around. He's uh, he's he's like my my best buddy. And um, but it really does it really does uh, I, I think affect everything that you do. I had a friend who was an uh, acupuncturist. He's passed away uh, since many years ago. But I was kind of asking him. This is when I first got married, you know, and asking him because he had a, a lot of kids and he was somebody that I really respected. And I, I, I asked him, so, you know, do you like having kids? And because he's also an incredibly busy person. Yeah. And um, and he said something that was so interesting to me that always stuck into my my head. I said, he said, yeah, uh, you know what? What's really interesting is before you have kids, you think that, you know, the, the whole uh, the whole evolution of the universe has come down to this this mm -hmm. one moment, me, you know, and it's kind of made this 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 person happened and that's you that's what i am you know is this all of the universe and all of the humanity coming together and you know and, and now i this is my moment and here i am but once you have a kid you realize very quickly you're just a part of a continuum you know that that goes on and 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 you stop being that and, and that's what each of us are and um and so that informs my music it informs yeah. the 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 things that i choose to do it informs what i choose to do in my concerts it informs the the roles that i choose to pick in television and film and and i think it's really deepened everything uh as well but uh uh but you know the the, the other thing is my aunt said to me also you know what if you don't have kids you you're, you're not going to know you know you don't know your life there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with either way it really is your own personal choice so um for those people that don't have kids that's another life as well and it's just as full and rich and interesting but for me i you know it's it's a it i'm i'm now a part of that continuum well, we have to give a big shout out to your wife too, Allison Tucker, who I have known since the early days of her, you know, Broadway debuts and everything else, and have followed her. I just, I just love you guys. You're, you're all so great, and you, you brought up this beautiful son. I mean, what a great dynamic the three of you have. You made your own, you know, cocoon together, the three of you. It's so great. Yeah, life is good, and we've been married, I think, 26 years now, which is, yeah. like, oh, you know, my goodness, that's really, really uh, just uh, amazing, and I'm just so grateful for Allison, and she sends her love, by the way, when I told her, her I was uh, doing this uh, today, she may, be, she may even be watching. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, but yeah, she's it, she's an amazing human being as well. And I, I got very fortunate uh, with her. You know, I, it's I, I've been I've been uh, really lucky, I think, in life to have have just found some amazing, uh, amazing human beings, I, I, I call them. And I'm married to one of those amazing human beings, you know, and people like Joe Benincasa and Ted Firth and and you. And, you know, there's all of these amazing artists and souls and people that are are trying to leave the planet better than they uh it was than than when they got there you know yeah. and um it it's uh it's very inspiring to me to uh and i feel very very grateful uh you know i, I can't believe my life uh, all the yeah. time i pinch myself and go wow what what did i must have done something good Oh, yes, you did. And we're going to talk about some of those artists now because you have such an incredible career. I've been, I just, I've known all your work, but I want to mention some of the highlights and just tell me what comes to mind, a fun story, you know, or a great memory. Uh, you made your Broadway debut in the um, Michael Rupert, and is it Jerry Colker? Yes, Jerry Colker. Yeah. 
musical male. I remember seeing you jumping over the couch. So it's like, what do you remember? Broadway debuts are so magical. So many people were supposed to make them this past spring and then the pandemic hit. So I hope that they'll all be given that chance when the theater comes back bigger than better than ever. So just how, what do you remember about your Broadway debut in male and how magical was it? It, well, it was so magical. The, when you asked that, the, the first thing that comes into mind was walking into the Music Box Theater uh, the first time that we set foot in the theater. Um, and um, we didn't walk through the stage door. The kind of the loading door was open. And I remember walking in from the street and all that was on the stage was the ghost light, you know, on the stage. And I remember standing on the stage and just looking into the audience and thinking, wow, this I finally made it to Broadway. This It's something that I had been wanting to do, even though a lot of people knew me from television. I was actually trained in the stage and uh so uh, i always thought of myself as a stage performer and to be standing there in that in that theater uh was incredible and also then i think i I think I was the youngest member of the company, which I was for a very long time because I started at a very young age. And then the last show that I did there was Shuffled Along, which yeah. was also at the Music Box. And it was the first time that I was the oldest person in the company. And I said, oh, man. But I think I, I, I count that as a blessing. So, <laughs> yeah. What a full circle moment to have started your career in mail at the music box and then shuffle along is one of my favorite musicals. I mean, I just, I saw it like three or four times during that run. Favorite memory. You got to share the stage with Audrey McDonald again, and that incredible group of people, favorite memory of doing shuffle along. What's it for you Stokes? I think my favorite memory about doing shuffle along was the, the opportunity to kind of resurrect these incredible artists, these incredible people that dealt with such adversity and had this incredibly creative project that literally changed the world. It changed theater as we know, know it. Yeah. It brought syncopation uh, into music and jazz into music. Uh, as, as George said in the script that he wrote, you know, it brought the uptown downtown and downtown uptown. Um, it was uh, the first time I think that um, uh, there were uh, the uh, uh, theater was integrated uh, as well, the audience. Um, and uh, so to be able to to bring these people back because it, there are people that most people, unless you really, really know your m musical theater history, yeah. Shuffle Along is one of those things that has been relegated to a, a footnote in most theater books. And, and even the books that I have, and I have a lot of theater books, uh, maybe they write a paragraph about it because, yeah. you know, there was also nothing to preserve it. They didn't record cast albums or anything then. There were no Tony Awards back yeah. then. Um, so it was a very, very different time. But that book, that that, oh. that musical changed uh, the face of, of, of musical theater. And that that for me was, I think, for the for all of us in the company. Um, was the the best part of it to be able to to bring these people back to the to the fore and then to also work with people yeah. like george wolf again and savion glover and audrey and you know it, it was again a, it felt like a cast of, of family and we just yeah. had the most fun making that show it was like fireworks I, i'm thinking back to it now it was like you walked into that theater everything about that show was like fireworks going off it was so it was so electrifying that musical yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I think it's almost like being in George Wolf's brain yeah. because that's how his head is. He's electrifying. He's an electrifying uh, um, director, uh, one of my favorite directors of all time. He's just, his rehearsal sessions are, are so much fun. Um, and George is such a brilliant human being. You know, he, you, you see him just walk into the room in a rehearsal session. You can see him take everybody in. He like sees, okay, I can see what they're feeling and what's going on. And he knows what to do with that. And it's just, I just love him to, to pieces. And also his, his mind for theater history, for, for African-American history, for African-American theater history. Um, all of that, you know, is put in with this joy and this passion and this wisdom and this knowledge and this, this artful skill um, that, uh, that few people, few people possess. Because was the first time you worked with George Jelly's Last Jam? Yeah, and I didn't actually get to work with George yeah. very much in that show because I replaced, as you know, I replaced uh, Gregory Hines. And generally, when you're a replacement on a show, um, you rehearse with the stage manager. And then the last day, you might have a meeting with the the, uh, the director. The same thing happened on uh, on Kiss of the Spider Woman. That's I worked with, I think, Hal Prince for one day. Then later on, we got to be, you know, friends yeah. and we got 
be be close. And the same thing with George. Um, but yeah, this was the, the most that I'd actually gotten to work with him because I was doing then a show that had already been created as opposing to creating a show with uh, George at the same time. So uh, and it, it, it was everything that I, I hoped it would be. How amazing. Because did, did a few of you go into Jelly's Last Jam at the same time? It was me. It was Felicia Rashad yeah. and Ben Vereen. I think the three of us went in at the same time. And um, yeah, it was really amazing. And that was that was not long after. It was the first show that Ben did after his yeah. accident. Uh, for, for those that remember, he got had a terrible uh, he was hit yeah, walking on the side of the road. And, uh, um, you know, and he's a dancer, you know, to lose his his ability to to dance, at least temporarily. But that was the first show that he did um, and, and and recovered from that. And also, Ben, you know, I mean, I, I was uh, in awe of Ben from from Pippin. And he was one of those people that I that I'd uh, uh, watched and imitated and stole yeah. from as well. And now Ben has become a great friend as, as well as Felicia as well. We, we just it's. It's nice, you know, when I think back how long I've been doing this, it's, uh, you know, and that's why I'm the oldest fart in the theater now. Uh, I've been doing this for so long. It's like 40 years now, I think, uh, more than 40 years. And it, it's just great to have that kind of history and to kind of have the opportunity to work with the heroes and the people that have inspired you as well. And I've had that opportunity many, many times. And I, I just feel really, really grateful. Yeah. Well, I have to mention David Merrick because I loved OK. And I just want to ask you, what was it like working with and just being around David Merrick? Wow, that's a great question. I have so many David Merrick stories. And David Merrick, uh, for those for those that don't know yeah. David Merrick, He's been kind of unfavorably called the abominable showman. If yeah. you've ever heard, you know, a terrible story about a producer, it was very likely about David Merrick. And David Merrick, when uh, when I first did my audition, people, because uh, uh, I didn't know that much about David Merrick. I knew his name. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And, and some people were saying, well, what are you doing? I had this audition for this new show uh, that David Merrick is doing. And everybody's reaction was, oh, David Merrick, oh, you better watch out. You better be careful. I was thinking, why, why? Yeah. And uh, then finally, when I, I was flown out to meet David uh, 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 Merrick um, and auditioned for him in, in uh, New York, because my first rehearse, uh, audition was in uh, Los Angeles, um, I remember waiting in this room for a very long time. Somebody else was, was rehearsing. And then the door finally opened and this man walks out and he was seen it was almost like remember tim conway's old man character um that he used to do mr he, wiggins yes mr wiggins yes because this was post stroke david yeah. merrick had a stroke and um so he he couldn't get many words out and he would get maybe one sentence out and then it would kind of go into a garble and he was walking very very slowly and after hearing all of these things from people you know about oh david merrick watch out for him and this this man walks out slowly down the hall i remember thinking to myself this this is david merrick um and my one regret actually it's not really regret but you know my one wish from that show was because he and I had a great relationship, yeah. was that I, I wish that he had his power of speech. I would have loved to have gone to lunch with him and just sat and listened to him tell tell stories and tell things from his point of view as well, because he produced more than, I think, 88 or 89 shows by the time he passed away. And, you know, Hello, Dolly, and just, you know, amazing hits and amazing flops as well and uh, and everybody has david merrick story i could i could we could do five shows about my experience here and and stories of, of david merrick but uh another little side story there uh when i auditioned uh, for the show when i came out here i uh my agent called me and said oh they're also looking to um uh, for a uh, sporting life in porgy and bess at the metropolitan opera and would you like to go in and audition for that i thought Oh, okay, sure. And so while I was auditioning uh, for that, uh, for uh, David Merrick's show, I, I sat, went to the stage uh, on uh, the Metropolitan Opera. It was my first time ever at Lincoln Center. As <laughs> was actually walking on. My first time at Carnegie Hall, by the way, was also performing at Carnegie Hall. I'd never seen a show there. But I remember walking on this gigantic stage. James Levine was yeah. out there and singing without mics. Uh, for for uh, you know, uh, I think I did. A, There's a boat that's leaving soon, and um, I remember leaving, 
And um, and it was shortly after I got a call from my agent said saying that I got offered the role in David Merrick's musical, and I offer also got offered sport and life in Porgy and Bess at the Met. And um, they were kind of had two different schedules. And uh, I could have done them both. But David Merrick, I think, wanted me all to himself. So he said, OK, you have to choose. And, uh, you know, it was uh, difficult, but not so difficult because I knew that musical theater is really what I wanted to do. And as much as I would have loved to have done uh, uh, Porgy and Bess at the Met, um, uh, I, I, I think I made the right decision. You got to do a David Merrick musical. You got that on your checklist. Yes, exactly. And if, if the funny thing was, because it was very last minute, um, I ended up getting in, I think it's 19, was it, what, what year was that? 80 something. Um, the, the, the souvenir program for the Met, actually, my picture is in there. And it <laughs> says Sport and Life and Baritone and, you know, a little blurb about me because they had to get it in so quickly. Um, but uh, by the time, you know, the, all, all of it went through. So, so if somebody has that, that's a little interesting little artifact. Okay. You know, Anybody too. watching this, go to eBay, type that in, try to find this. I want one of those. I'm going to start looking for that. You know, you then got to co-star opposite the one and only Cheetah Rivera, who you know is one of my all-time favorite people. Um, you played Valentine in that stunning John Kander, Fred Ebb, Terrence McNally musical, Kiss of a Spider Woman, like you said, directed by Hal Prince. What was it like sharing the stage with Cheetah, and what did you learn the most from her? Oh man! Uh, well, Allison calls Cheetah my girlfriend, yeah. and uh, and I do too. I love Cheetah uh, so much. Yeah. Here's what I here's what I learned from Cheetah when when I walked in the show. I remember the first time I rehearsed on the stage. Uh, I was rehearsing, and then I hear this kind of hubbub from from the the stage right wing, and and it's Cheetah coming in. I I don't know if she why she was there so early, and she came in and she gave me the biggest hug and said, "Oh, we're so glad that you're here," and she was so warm. And um, and what I realized is as the show went on and, and starting to work with her, she knew everybody's name in the theater. She treated everybody with respect. She treated everybody also, uh, she, she knew that they knew how to do their job. And, and she, she, uh, she was never mean to anyone, but she always came in with her A game. Um, and you you didn't want to do anything but that when you were with her. Um, yeah. And I, what I learned most from that, and and I've 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 told this story a, a few times, but I I said to myself because I did that show for uh, I think two years. I did it with Cheetah and then Maria Conchita Alonso. I did it with Vanessa Williams, who also was amazing. Um, but starting with Cheetah, um, I re just watching her. I said to myself, if I ever get to be the lead of a Broadway yeah. show that's how I'm going to do it. And she, to this day, has been my my mentor and my teacher. And my I think of her uh, when I when I do that. You know, it's about showing up, doing your work, knowing what you're doing, be professional, um, be kind to people, respect what they're doing, um, uh, know that they're doing their job in the best way that they can. Uh, and and that's that's the most that I took away from that. I mean, I could, again, I, we could do oh, yeah. another three shows about Cheetah Rivera as well, because I, I just love her so, and she's amazing. But, and, and the one thing I remember that's it, it, just embedded into my mind is, um, is her in that white suit, so, taking that cigarette out of her mouth and then flicking it back with her foot. Yeah. You know, the other things that Cheetah does is, is, um, Every, there's not a wasted movement. There's not a wasted, every second is a work of art. You could photograph her on stage and every photograph would be, <gasps> you know, she's just so aware of her body and what she's doing and, and, and stage pictures. And um, Allison got to do a, a, a dancer's life with her on Broadway as well yeah. and, and loves her uh, as much. So she's, she's a very special person to. Oh yeah. She's the best. You know, you then got to create the role of Cole House Walker Jr. in the Terrence McNally, Lynn Aarons, and Stephen Flaherty masterpiece, Ragtime. How life-changing was that role and that show for you? It was totally life-changing. I knew from the first uh, workshop that we did that yeah. this was going to be special. This was some, this was going to change my life. Um, uh, when uh, uh, Stephen... Uh, 
had written for the very we did like three workshops of this in in toronto a black box musical we did first a reading around the table and there wasn't much written then i think they'd written only four or five songs at that point and the script was still not being written terence wasn't even at the first uh uh uh, reading that we did because he was working on another show so we it was more like a musical rehearsal but i remember we were all sitting around this gigantic group of tables that had been there or there were probably 40 of us sitting around and uh one of the things that Stephen had written was the very first and you know the first line with the little boy says and i remember when that started feeling something humongous descend on the room is what it felt like and i felt oh what is going on here and i don't think i was the only one that felt it we knew that we were in the middle of something really 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 special and um and i mean there were things that happened there was a kind of a synergistic thing about that show it felt like somewhere off in the ether yeah. Before we all got to the planet, you know, we all met and said, oh, I'm going to study acting. I'm going to study composing. I'm going to study choreography. I'm going to study, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, lyric writing. I'm going to study uh, uh, all of these things. And, we, and we're all going to get together on this planet and do something really amazing uh, at one point. Uh, a, a story about that, this is one of my best takeaways from it. How much time do we have, by the way? We uh, have another we've done 15 minutes. We're good. Oh, we're good. 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 We're good. Uh, 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 I can sit one, with you forever. One, one of my... Um, uh, uh, stories uh, that that I that I remember the moments that I remember most was during you know I'd worked on the show for so long and it, the show was getting just amazing responses from audiences and critics and everybody and you know everybody as as people on Broadway tend to do is oh my God that was incredible oh this show's going to win the Tony you're going to win the Tony this is Tony 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 everybody talks about the Tony and um, you know and I'm thinking oh wow this. <laughs> Well, maybe this will be the life changing thing that yeah. I thought. And, and that was was indeed my my first nomination, you know, but we were thinking all this, you know, this is great. That was the show to beat. And then the Lion King opened yeah. and then it all of a sudden became, you know, a very different kind of thing because nobody knew what that was going to be. And and in the Tonys, uh, they ended taking most of the Tonys. And I think we got two or three of them. I didn't win. I thought it was my first Tony loss. And but as I like to say, you lose more than you win in yeah. life anyway. And um, and I remember uh, you, as much as you don't want to to be let down, you know, I, I remember the whole cast just, you know, because we didn't win Best Musical. And um, right. uh, and I, I remember us being you know kind of deflated and you don't want to do that because, the, you know, the audience, you still have to go in and perform the next day for the audience that comes to see the show. And and they've paid full price for it and they're wanting to see ragtime. And so you're trying to do your best, but you're just trying to get through this kind of disappointment and everything. And the audience was fantastic because they all you know, yeah. saw the Tony Awards as well. Um, so, you know, for a few days, we we're in this funk and, and a few days after the Tony Awards um, in Texas, I, can't, I think it was Plano, I don't remember, I, in Texas, a, a man, a gentleman named James Bird, uh, an African-American man, was dragged behind a truck. He was chained to a truck of these three racists um, and, and dragged until basically he fell apart. His body did. And he, of course, died during that. And when that happened and we got news of that, the entire cast uh, gathered before the show, as we often you know, would do, and we just kind of discussed what was going on. And you know, saying we're we're doing this for for James Bird, you know, and his family tonight, this performance. And at the end of that performance, I remember um, again a, a huge hand from the audience, and it was really it, you know accepted beautifully. And I remember as we took our bow, I remember rising up from my bow and feeling really ashamed. I felt ashamed that I was disappointed that we didn't win a Tony Award yeah. because I realized, you know what, this is much bigger than that. You know, this show is dealing with what we're still dealing with today, what's still going on right now, um, issues in our country. Um, and I remember just feeling so ashamed and I thought never again will I feel sad about not losing a, a, a Tony Award and I have to keep you know, my eyes on why, why this is being done. Um, later on, I got, um, um, uh, I mean, I, I kept getting incredible letters from people 
Um, but later on, it's like the universe saying, yes, yes, you know, and giving you uh, uh, confirmation about things. But later on, I got this incredible letter and I have to find it. I kept it and it's sitting, sitting out in storage. I want to find this letter again from this young man. I think he was 20 years old. I think he was from Florida. And he, he wrote this long, long letter to me. And it was like, this is in the old days and people remember, remember letters. Uh, and I got it in my dressing room and um, I opened that up. It's like six pages or five pages long. It's like single space line and it's a very long letter. And I thought, what is this letter about? And he's, he's telling me about his life. He says, I hate my name is so-and-so and I live in, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a Caucasian uh, a young man. I'm 20 years old. And, and, and then he proceeds to tell me about his life. And I thought, where is he going with this? Why is he writing this letter? And then I got to the very last paragraph of the letter and the very last paragraph of the letter said, the reason I'm writing this letter is to tell you that um, two weeks ago, I came to see you in ragtime. And when I left the theater, I realized that I've been a racist all my life and didn't even know it. And I went, oh, it was, I mean, still I get chills when I tell that story because that's the power of art. Yeah. That's the power of what we do. Art has, like nothing I know, except for a traumatic incident. I don't know anything else that can, maybe childbirth would be the other thing like that. But in one epiphanal moment, change somebody's life. And even childbirth is kind of gradual, you know. Uh, you, as you grow with it, you know, a child, you know, you, you start having these kind of realizations. But the theater, you can walk out of the theater a different person than you did when you walked in because you, of what you saw on the stage. It changes you and you have realizations about yourself. The realization may be, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. I thought I was the only person with that problem or with that thought or with that demon or with that, you know, joy or w whatever it is. Um, and you realize uh, that when you leave that theater, you're, you become a different person. And that young man, that letter confirmed for me that. And again, that's the power of art. That's why the arts are so important, because they have that opportunity. And I bet each one of the people that are watching this right now, and I'm sure you have a story as well, have a story where you felt changed by oh, a, totally, a, yeah. something, you know, by a, th a theatrical experience or maybe watching a film or maybe reading a book or maybe looking at a piece of art in a museum on a wall that forever changed you that's what that's the magic of art and um when i when i see art getting cut first from yeah. the programs in schools and from from city budgets you know the, the, that's usually what gets cut it just hurts my heart so because i yeah. i'm really I, i'm on a i'm on a campaign now to really try to help people it's what i one of the things that i really want to focus on um now is 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 really uh, helping people, us as uh, as individuals and as a nation as well, and as an economy, you know, um, as, as a government, all of those things to understand the importance of art in our lives um, and how how much they change people and change us for the better, uh, and 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 uh, and define who our society is as well. Uh, but it's it's the artists that kind of lead the way, but in a very subtle way uh, often. So uh, but that was a great example to me. And I've had I've had a, a few since uh, like that as well. That's incredible. you got to find that letter. You know, we have a few more minutes left. You know, you finally did win the Tony Award and the Triple Crown, actually, the Outer Critics Circle, the Drama Desk, and everything for your beautiful performance in Cole Porter's Kiss Me, Kate. But that also gave you the opportunity of working with the late, great Marin Maisie again, who you worked with on Ragtime. What was it like sharing the stage with Marin? I love Marin Maisie yeah. so much. Um, it was she was a really, really special person, an incredible artist, uh, just uh, like Cheetah. Always yeah. came in with her A game, um, you know. And I knew we were going to have a, a great time. Uh, Ragtime, honestly, was kind of traumatic for a lot of people because yeah. when we did it in Toronto. Uh, the producer, Garth Drabinsky, you know, had promised we knew this was a special show. Everybody knew this was something. And um, 
And so he said, okay, here's what's going to happen. We're going to open in Toronto. We'll be here for like three months. And then we're going to move to the United States. We'll go to Los Angeles or Boston, or we're going to have an out of town tryout somewhere. And then we're going to move to Los Angeles. Well, what ended up happening was, um, uh, uh, people, you know, about three months in, people started getting calls from friends saying, hey, I hear they're doing ragtime in, in Los Angeles. Am I right for your part? You know, and and so I, I had a conversation with Garth about that. I said, Garth, what's going on with this? And he said he decided that he was going to open a separate company. Yeah. This company was going to stay in Toronto for all of that time. And then we were going to cut. That would be the, the New York company. But um, but it was heartbreaking because everybody wanted to have the United States premiere of the show that had been working on the show for years. And all of a sudden now there was going to be another company that was going to open this. Well, unbeknownst to Garth, he had forgotten that I had in my contract right of first refusal for London, for Los Angeles, for you know a lot of major cities. And um, he asked me not to leave. But I knew I wanted to go like everybody else did. And also that was, you know, my hometown for a long, long yeah. time. And so I went and I and I uh, stayed there uh, and I opened the show there. But the, the rest of the company stayed in Toronto for a year. So yeah. when they got back together, there was a lot of damage there. There were a lot of damaged people. They weren't mad at me, but they were very unhappy with with Garth and the situation. So um, and it took a time to get over. So when. Uh, Marin and I first got together for Kiss Me Kate. We met at a lunch. I said, Marin, let's have lunch because of all the people in the cast, she's the one that I knew the least because yeah. our our roles, are, yeah. we never saw each other off stage. And when we're on stage, the few times we're on stage together, we're like, okay, who are you? What's going on here? And, you know, those are the where the two characters were. So we had this lunch and we just had the most fun at this lunch. And one of the things we promised each other, we did a little pinky handshake and we said, Marin, Let's have, because we talked about ragtime and all the trauma there too. And we yeah. said, Marin, let's have the most fun ever doing yeah. Kiss Me Eight. And we made a promise to each other. And that became our thing that we said. And I still say it to this day before I go on stage. Let's have the most fun ever. And we did. And and um, and I, I was I was just so disappointed when she didn't win the Tony, but yeah. she got hers posthumously. And man, did she yeah. deserve it many, many times over. So uh, I just I just love Marin Maisie, one of the one of the great gifts to American theater. Well, our, we have about three minutes left. The hours fly by fast. I, King it's Headley, me. King Headley yeah. too. You I, riveting, breathtaking. I mean, favorite memory of doing that. Oh wow! Well, that that was the most traumatic show that I've ever done. Here's yeah. why: because <laughs> um, when I f was doing finishing Kiss Me Kate, I was exhausted from that show. I hadn't had a vacation, and it was a very very difficult show to do. And I missed very, very few shows. And my agent said, called me and said, good news and bad news. The good, I said, what's the good news? The good news is you've been offered the, the lead role in, in August Wolf's next show. I said, oh, that's incredible. I said, what could possibly be the bad news? He said, well, the bad news is you're not going to have a vacation yeah. and you're only going to have nine days to rehearse it because uh, the, the, this show had already been in production in other places as well. And I thought, oh, well, I'll do it. Um, anyway, so I did it, but it was like, uh, uh, on, on the next show we'll do, I'll talk about my first, uh, my first almost nervous breakdown before the the first performance we did of it. Um, but I ended up getting getting through it. But it was very very difficult because you know that's there are ten monologues in that show. The, the closing of the first act is probably like a twelve page monologue of my character, and um, just having to memorize all that material and um, in, in such a short amount of time and put it in my body was very very difficult. But again, August Wilson. I loved him. I, I, I was so sorry that we lost him shortly after that show. That was the last show that he was around for. Um, uh, you know, uh, he did. Uh, he was around for a little bit of radio golf, but that was the last show that he was totally around for. And the and the theater that we did it was the what ended up becoming the August Wilson Theater, which was uh, when it was renamed as well, which was wonderful. You were brilliant in that. I know you were at like vocal problems. I know it was a very tough show for you to do, but boy, you were fabulous in that. Just so you know, so I hope you Thank look you. back on that as like one of the greatest for us as audience members to watch you do your thing. I do, Thank and Viola Davis is a co-star. I mean, yeah, you know, can't go wrong there. Then you took on one of the most glorious and one of the most landmarked musical theater roles ever for a man, Don Quixote in Man of the Mancha. How glorious was that role? Oh, it was, that was another special show. That was, for me, that show was kind of, it felt like um, uh, ragtime. You know, the applause at the end of ragtime 
there, yeah. there was I've never felt or heard applause like that in another show uh, before. And um, Man of La Mancha was the same way, and especially uh, after singing uh, um, uh, the Impossible Dream. I mean, the audience. I mean, it would stop the show and the audience would stand up after that. And I'd never felt that before. And again, I knew, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this. This is, you know, uh, this, this, that song has a magical message for anybody who, who hears it. You know, we each have our own impossible <laughs> dream, but I love Don Quixote and, and that, that, that character. And uh, again, working with a, a great, great company and, um, and Ernie Sabella. And it was a lot of fun, but that's, that's uh, one of my favorite roles of all time. I think yeah. maybe he's perhaps the most like me in, in real life. All right, final, this is my final show question. Women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. How much fun was that to do? Not so much fun. <laughs> that was actually, that was a very difficult show. There were lots of difficulties, you know, the, the, uh, one of them was the set that wasn't working uh, uh, properly. It was a very complex set. And so, uh, you know, there were lots of personality clashes on the show and, you know, and that one, there was so much uh, hope for, you could feel the audience coming in with the show with its incredible cast. I mean, lots of great friends. I mean, yeah. it was a lot of fun doing it. We had it's just a great, great time uh, working together. Um, but it, it was just disappointing because you, you could feel the audience at the beginning yeah. of the show. They were just so excited to see all of this incredible team put together and these incredible performers and the great score and still yes, yeah. score one of the best ever. And um, and then you could feel them kind of as the show went on it, they just kind of got like disappointed. And then by the end of the show, they were just, oh, thanks. You know, you can feel this kind of, this uh, a polite applause and, and appreciative applause, but you uh, you could feel the disappointment. Later on, they they actually re reworked the show in London. And I guess it was quite a big hit over there, but that's what we didn't have the time to yeah. do in previews because in, uh, of technical problems that we had. But um, it, was a, it was a great company to work with and lots of friends, you know, and that's the thing, even, even even in the shows that aren't good, like Cheetah says, you know, sometimes when you're doing a show that doesn't work, you want to you want to turn to the audience and say, "Hey, we're not doing this on purpose," <laughs> which I always love that line from her yeah. show, and and it's true, you know, everybody's doing their working their hardest and working on this incredibly high high level yeah. uh, of art. So even when when they when they when they fail, I, I have great respect for everybody involved in in uh, uh, in Broadway and, and and in these shows, you know, because it's it's really Really, really hard to, oh, to put on a, a Broadway show. Well, listen, this hour has flown by so quick. We are out of time, but I want to tell everybody once again, this coming Sunday afternoon, February 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Brian Stokes Mitchell will be live with Seth Rodetsky as part of a Seth concert series with a rebroadcast Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and a special VIP sound check ticket available at 12 noon on Sunday. The Seth concert series is produced by Mark Cortali. It is sponsored by Broadway World and StreamYard. Ticket are available at Broadway World Events at the SethConcerts.com. Just Google Brian Stokes Mitchell. Tickets are only $28.50. I have adored you since the first time I met you at Mail Stokes, just so you know that. Oh, thank you so much, Richie. And me, you. I, you're, you're, again, one of these great fixtures and great energies on Broadway. And I just so appreciate you and what you do and spreading the word and your love for this art form as well. And thank you. And it's a joy to be on your show and to be with, with all of your viewers as well. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great time. We'll see you on Sunday. Everybody stay safe and see you Sunday at Brian Stokes Mitchell Show. Take care, everyone. See you, everybody.